So I, I, everybody, uh, on behalf of the Electrical Engineering and Electrical and Computer Engineering Alumni Society of Ohio State University, uh, welcome to our first State of the Department address uh, by our, our department chair. Uh, we hope everyone is doing well and, and, and especially safe during these uh, incredible times that uh, we're in right now. Uh, hopefully what we're doing here tonight can provide a little diversion from from the um, you know, monotony of working from home and, and also dealing with all the news. I am Mark Morsher. I am the uh, chair of the Meetings and Planning Committee uh, of the Alumni Society. So uh, our role is to go ahead and try to identify opportunities for alumni to get engaged, uh, interact, network, as well as uh, expose and, and provide outreach and touching points into the department so that we can understand uh, what's going on with the department and, and interact with some of the staff and researchers and students and get a really good feel for what's going on within the department. So what we were trying to do, what we're trying to do with this session is to go ahead and try to reach out to a lot of our remote alumni. Uh, the vast majority of our alumni are distributed throughout the, the country and the world. Uh, so it's very hard to have centralized events. Uh, so what we're trying to do with this is to go ahead and provide a, a medium and a form so that you can uh, have a different way of uh, being uh, communicated to by the department and also you can, and the Alumni Society. And so you can get a, a, a more uh, firsthand understanding of what's going on in the direction of the department. So, um, you know, there, there's just so much going on with the department that you might not be aware of. Uh, the opportunities for the students and just uh, some great accomplishments that uh, hopefully coming away from the session will have a lot of pride uh, for your alma mater and, and the direction it's going. Uh, so for some logistics, uh, most of you should be uh, muted, if not uh, everyone, except for the speakers. Uh, so just go ahead and unmute if you have any questions or utilize the chat window uh, uh, capabilities. So if you want to go ahead and ask a question uh, during the session. We are going to have an open-ended Q&A session at the end. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll have a more of a discussion at that point. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, we are recording this. Uh, so hopefully we can post it and, and use it as a resource uh, for other people who couldn't attend the session. So what we'll start with is we'll start with uh, uh, the department chair and then move on to the Alumni Society. Uh, so our president, Sia Muhammad, will be uh, speaking and explain more about what the Alumni Society provides. Uh, but right now, I'll kick it off and introduce our uh, ECE department chair, Hashem El Gamel. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to Ryan, Carol, Zia for arranging this, and thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, let me start by, we cannot ignore the challenging time we're going through, so I wish everyone and their families are safe and sound and trying to enjoy each other as much as possible during that time. Uh, related to the challenge, so the first update before I go, more into the details about the department is how are we dealing with the COVID-19 COVID challenge. So as, as you all know, uh, we moved on to a virtual world now for our instruction and our research. And we literally asked our faculty, staff, and students to change everything they are doing overnight. We give them less than two weeks to get ready, and they are doing just a remarkable job. So this is our first week of classes using Zoom, and I have not heard a single complaint. Uh, actually, the engagement of our students is even more than we're used to. So I'm hearing about classes that have full attendance. I'm hearing about office hours that have more than 90 students showing up. Our advisors are fielding questions left and right. The university has done really a good job with adding flexibility and being thoughtful about that time and how it's affecting our faculty and students. So uh, just uh, quick updates about certain decisions that were made, I think are very, very thoughtful. First one was related to the faculty tenure clock. So Ohio State have extended the tenure clock of all our uh, pre-tenure faculty by a year, just so they are not stressed out. Uh, we, ha we are adding a pass, no pass option in all the classes uh, for the major, for the students. It should be announced on Monday. And we're actually allowing them also an incomplete. We realize that uh, they are anxious and, and stressed out by what's going on. And we're trying our best to maintain the quality of the education while being very 
thoughtful and empathetic to the tough times they are going through. So I'm actually very optimistic. In fact, we had a, a department meeting today and we were discussing that this is this is not just a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So this is a giant experiment we're going through right now. The whole nation is delivering uh, education and performing research in different ways. So I was talking to our faculty and instructors about collecting data about the creative ideas they are using and the engagement of the students, what works, what doesn't work, encouraging all of them to communicate and work together because by the end of the semester, we should have a tremendous amount of understanding of things uh, that we didn't even dare to think that we could experiment with. So when you think about online education, everybody has an opinion. Some people thought this is a future of higher education. Some people were very much against it. But it was all of this was based on guesses, hypotheses. But now we actually are experimenting with it. And we are also looking at this uh, as an opportunity to realize that life will be different after that. So especially from a higher education perspective, we don't expect to go back to the same old ways. We don't expect others to go back to the same old ways. So from our perspective, this could be an opportunity for us to lead the way if we actually figure out the, the right path forward. So next year, I think we're going to be innovating on different ways of education and different ways of uh, engaging our students in research and different ways of working together. And summer will be a time for creativity that we hope will, will get us to the next level. So the first big update for us, something that we're all very proud of, is uh, if you're uh, following our one and only Ryan Horns on his media outlets, you know that this year our ranking, the U.S. News ranking, have moved up from 30 to 22nd. This is a big jump. Actually, eight, eight places is not easy. And it's, it's a testament to the quality and the excellence and the hard work for everyone in the department. You as alumni have been always supporting and you should be proud of your department. This is a remarkable achievement. Uh, when I started my service as a chair, uh, I was sharing that again today in, in our department meeting. My feeling was we are underranked. I still think we're underranked. Uh, my feeling we could be with some hard work, with some PR, move into the top 15. Uh, I felt at that time the top 10 is quite difficult just because of issues related to resources and, uh, and perceptions of others about ranks and things like that. But actually with the challenge we're facing, I feel we have a really, really good shot of making it to the top 10. Uh, this could be our strategic objective in the next few years. Uh, our department has invested a lot over the years in our culture, in our people. Those are our greatest assets. And that's a time where this culture is shining. So if we actually continue on the path we are on right now, if we empower the, our best minds to create, uh, the next wave of higher education will be different. It's not going to be universities that have the highest endowment. It's not going to be the old names that everybody knows. People who will figure out what the higher education should be will come on top. And I think we are in a very good position to be one of those. So I am very optimistic and happy with, with, with how we're dealing with the challenge. Uh, credit goes to, to the frontliners, the lecturers, the instructors, the GTAs. We're actually asked them to do a miracle, a small miracle. I mean, if you're, let's put ourselves in the shoes of an instructor who's teaching a class with 400 kids. And we just came one day and says, starting, there is a spring break. After they come back, everything will be different. You have to figure out how you teach online. You have to do it synchronously and asynchronously. You have to grade differently. You have to work with your GTA differently. Same applies with Capstone. Same applies with Lab. Same applies with Master Project. Everything had to be turned around. And the way I see it now, we're doing just a remarkable job. So this is only a beginning of a future for our department that I think could be really, really bright. So that's how I see the challenge we're in right now. I have a few slides with just quick updates about our progress last year. Uh, so I'll share it with you. So the ranking was my first thing, something we're really proud of. In the last, uh, in, in fall 19, we went through 
an external academic review, a comprehensive review by the department. This is a process uh, that's conducted under the supervi supervision of our Office of Academic Affairs, basically the provost office. It's a once every 10 year pro uh, process. So basically, uh, OAA, uh, with our recommendation, picks three world-class leaders, academic leaders from across the nation. We prepare what's called a self-assessment report, uh, talking about our department, our opportunities, our challenges. We send it to them, they visit us, and after that, they submit a report to the provost about how they feel about the department. And the report that our, first of all, the three reviewers were the vice chancellor of UC Irvine, a vice provost from Georgia Tech, and an ECE department chair from Minnesota. And the report they wrote with couldn't be more excellent. It was a glowing report about the quality of our staff, students, and the faculty. It literally says, said, we are ready for the next leap forward. There is a number of recommendations on the report that built on the strengths we have. So one of the things that they were very impressed about was how passionate everybody in the department was about diversity, inclusion, and equity mission. Uh, so they gave us few recommendations. Uh, Betty Lees, Andrea Serrani, and myself, our distinguished associate chairs and myself are working on them. And we, were, we have been making good progress on that. So that was a, a point that validated that our progress is moving in the right direction, and we were very happy with it. Uh, on January 2020, Ohio State launched a new institute focused on cybersecurity and digital trust. This is a multidisciplinary institute that cuts across multiple colleges, um, and ECE plays a significant role in it. So one of the big uh, tasks for this institute is to build our uh, uh, a, a giant test bed for, uh, for research and education in cybersecurity and digital trust, and to connect that test bed to Ohio Cyber Range, uh, whose mission is to educate our citizens about cybersecurity. And we have just won a Third Frontier grant uh, led by our professor, uh, Elam Ikiji, and another what's called a rapid grant, and they, both of them are under this institute, they are funded by the state of Ohio to allow us to build this testbed. The vision for this testbed is quite exciting. It's a virtual testbed. It's not gonna be like uh, located in one location. The notion is to focus on our strength in mobility, manufacturing, and IoT, and build on the labs and uh, the, the activity going on in different areas of campus and connect them through the cloud. So. When people are inventing and working in those labs, that information can be disseminated naturally through this virtual testbed, through uh, outreach activities, through other institutes in Ohio. We are determined to work with everybody in the state of Ohio toward our common interest. Um, under the same uh, initiative of cybersecurity and digital trust, uh, last year we got a number of uh, centers of excellence from Air Force labs, on hardware security. Uh, this is emerging to be a very uh, strong area for us, led by Professor Walid Khalil in ECE and ECL, ESL. And uh, we're actually building this into what we call full stack security. So we're working with faculty in computer science and in the industrial uh, and system engineering to build uh, on our strength in software and hardware security and uh, distinguish ourselves from most of the work that's going on right now. I'm currently serving as a co-director for this institute. Uh, this is a commitment for one year until we get it off the ground and then there will be a search uh, for, uh, for a permanent director for this. Uh, my partner in, in doing this is our chief information security officer, Helen Patton. Over the last year, our faculty and, and students had a countless number of awards and recognition. I could not actually list them in one slide. I can just briefly mention the highlights, a few of the highlights. Our professor, uh, one and only Kevin Passenu, uh, was just awarded the highest recognition by the College of Engineering, the Scott Award. Uh, Kevin is just an exemplary scholar, uh, well-rounded excels in multiple things, 
uh, very passionate about uh, education and research. And at the same time, uh, you cannot find a better control theorist than him. And uh, hopefully, I mean, many of you hopefully have taken his classes. One of my best friends, and we're all very proud of him. Last year, a few of our young faculty have won the NSF Career Award. Uh, this is the most prestigious uh, uh, grant given by NSF for faculty in their early career. Uh, Professor Kirian Ali and Nima Gelishachan, both of them got it in the last two years. It's quite remarkable because they got it in their first attempt, which is quite unusual. Our center of high voltage, uh, Chippy, uh, continue to excel. Jin Wang, Julia Jang, Anant Agrawal, and uh, Lanya Zhu, uh, they, they got more money in one year than I have got in like my 20 years as a faculty. Um, so the one number of grants for the Department of Energy and AFRL, they are running a fantastic operation and we're very proud of them. Attila Ayalmaz was a co-PI on a big MURI grant. MURI is the biggest fundamental research um, program run by DOD, and Attila was a uh, part with a co-PI on one of those. And um, the culture, the diverse cult culture of the department is actually shown in how entrepreneurial our faculty are. So Emery Coxall is now uh, serving as a CEO of his startup, Data Anchor, Last year, he raised uh, $1.25 million uh, venture capital money. His company is based in Ohio, and he, he just won the Innovator of the Year Award by the College of Engineering. Just today, uh, two Accelerator Awards were announced uh, to Professor Sanjay Krishna and Professor Emery Ertin. Both of them are working on building companies based on innovations in the research group. Uh, just to know how, how much of quality uh, the, our department have uh, has um, those two awards are two out of the nine university-wide. So the university awarded nine accelerator awards, two of them went to our department. Um, now looking again at the future, uh, I've been uh, working with our senior vice president of research, Dr. Morley Stone, our Dean, uh, Dean Williams and uh, Dean Ritter, Dean Gretchen Ritter from Art and Science. For some time, we have been discussing this notion of the future of computing and information sciences. Um, so today, yesterday, Morley announced a task force uh, that's joined between College of Engineering, Art and Science, and Office of Research that basically look at our next big idea. Uh, the state of Ohio, just before the outbreak, uh, reached out to us and asked us, asked us a question. How can you triple the number of graduates on those areas out of Ohio State? Uh, recently, they announced a $100 million uh, grant to the University of Cincinnati along those lines. Do you want to build a similar center of excellence, if you will, in Columbus? Uh, now we're working together with Art and Science. I'm co-leading this task force. Um, we're looking at this in a very open-minded and, um, and creative way. So we want to look at different education models. How would we allow our students in Art and Science to acquire skills that can make them employable while still pursuing their passion? How do we allow our students in engineering to branch out and acquire the essential skills offered by art and science that make them the well-rounded engineers that can be successful in, 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 uh, in, in the industry? So we want to formulate a, a, a big vision for the future of our graduates and work together across colleges, across research. We want to look at different ideas, certificates that allow them to acquire this, an immersive learning experience where they can start their research from day one at the school. The sky is the limit. We are in the process of formulating our vision. And of course, we will go after, uh, after funding. Uh, we also want to be uh, mindful of the fact that there may be more funding than those just 100 million, because with the stimulus that's going to come, with the need to uh, teach and educate our kids in different ways. Maybe this, the state will look at this uh, with more with more aggressive eye for investment in the future. Uh, but ECE is going to be uh, an important and critical 
element in this vision because again everybody recognized the quality and the contributions of our department last year we have taken uh, many steps to um, to open up our undergrad education to modernize it to make it uh, more fun more uh, to allow our kids to do things that they were not thinking about it before so the first step we did was change our uh, pre-major admission policy to holistic admission. This is a realization from us that GPAs or the GPA doesn't capture everything. Of course, the GPA is important, will remain important, but there are other things. So holistic admission will allow us to admit kids who we believe will be successful in our major. And it will allow us to pursue our mission of uh, of enhancing the diversity and inclusion uh, of our, our classroom and our department. Uh, we're working hard on in introducing an Internet of Things track. Uh, Professor Ayla Mikiji, uh, Steve Bibbick, Jack Fort, Greg Chapman are working together on a very foundational course that we believe can be a foundation for uh, a different computer engineering. Um, I see the future of this department not just limited to classical computer engineering from a hardware perspective. I don't see any problem with us teaching software. I mean, uh, there is something called software engineering. It doesn't necessarily reside with computer science. It can be in our department. So this is just the first step toward being uh, more aligned with the demand from the kids' interest, the industry interest, and what we believe is scholarly. Uh, we have been working really hard on recruiting students from diverse backgrounds and underrepresented groups. I hope that effort will start paying off this year. The number of applicants to our major is very healthy, and this work will take time to start providing us the, the, the reward that we are looking at. In terms of graduate education, uh, we've been really focused on this notion of a community of scholars. We want all of us to feel that we're one community. So uh, example of things we do uh, every month now, uh, I host a meeting with our graduate students where I also invite two of our faculty and we open the floor for the students to ask them questions about life, to connect with them, their experience. We talk about things like uh, what does it, what does it, what does it, what does make a good thesis? What does make a good paper? What do you, how, why do you got into academia? Some of our faculty were in industry before academia. So what's the difference between industry and academia? We want the kids, uh, I, I always call them the kids, we want the students to feel connected with us in ways that's not simply taking a class and worrying about the grade or worrying about writing a paper. This is, mentorship is about developing the students, developing them in every aspect. So the meetings like this, we hold a social every Thursday. We're changing our policies to be aligned with this. So we are working on a new qualifier exam that aims to maintain the academic quality while reducing the stress and anxiety for the students. So, for example, the typical qualifier exam that I went through when I was a student, you go into the exam, you can be asked any questions. The idea that the questions themselves are unpredictable is a large source of anxiety. So some of the things we're thinking about is to make a question bank or to make the areas that the students are going to be asked and known beforehand. So we feel um, fun is essential and that you don't have to compromise quality to have fun at the same time. Uh, we are looking at ways for deeper and broader support of our grad students. So. Some of the ideas we will introduce soon is this notion of a teaching fellow where our GTAs, we can, we'll offer it to uh, students who pass their comprehensive or uh, candidacy exam. Um, if they are interested in academic job after that, then they can teach a class. So they will get a teaching fellowship for one year and they can teach a section of a class or a class under the mentorship of another faculty. That will give them the ability to really dig deep and uh, practice teaching and develop their teaching skills uh, in a safe and sheltered environment. It will help them from a CV perspective as well. 
The same with the research fellows. So we're introducing, uh, hopefully soon, this notion of uh, sponsoring one of our graduate students, one student per year, based on a competition run by the fellowship committee, where they can visit another institute for a semester. So you are a graduate student, your advisor has collaborative uh, relationships with faculty in MIT, Stanford, any university, and you can go there and spend a semester there. Diversity and exposure is very important in undergrad and graduate education. So that will give you a different exposure. You will see a different culture. It's also aligned with our focus on recruiting our own undergrad students for our graduate program. So students at our undergrad program who are interested in pursuing their graduate program, we want them to consider us. And if they are interested, we would like to welcome them in our program. There is a traditional thinking uh, in graduate education in general that you should, you should encourage your students to leave and go to a different place because you want them to experience a different culture. So our thinking is we still want that to happen, but we also would like to retain our best talent. So we feel a good approach that we're going to try is ask them to stay, provide them the best education environment that you can, and at the same time, allow them to get the exposure they need to see life from different perspectives. So that's one idea, but uh, we can experiment with others. But the, the main focus is to give them the deeper and broader education that they need to excel as scholars after that. Uh, over the last 18 months, we've been talking um, in our retreats, we've been talking between each other, we work together on a proposal on formulating our vision. Uh, in January, we submitted an NSF proposal in a program that's called DREAD, which uh, stands for Revolutionizing Engineering Education. And that program asks you to look at your department and think, how can, how can you create a revolution to the future? So the vision that we came up with is written in this slide, which actually is a culmination of a lot of discussions between us. And the vision is centered around a very unique and pioneering concept, in my opinion, which is to embrace wellness, the notion of wellness, as a platform for enabling students, staff, and faculty to achieve creative excellence in a joyful, healthy, and inclusive environment. This vision is aligned with who we are, is aligned with the vision of Ohio State, because wellness is a big strategic goal of Ohio State. We actually, our Dean of uh, Nursing uh, is also our Chief Wellness Officer. Wellness is a notion that encompasses diversity, inclusion, and equity, which are things we're very passionate about. Creativity does not come from a place of stress, at least in my opinion. It comes from a place of joy. Creativity is different than productivity. So if we want people to create, we have to think very different than if we just want them to produce. So we are converging as a department on that very revolutionary concept that we need all to think about the wellness of each other. We need our faculty to think about the wellness of their students. We need our students and our staff and our administration to think about the wellness, physical and mental, of the faculty. And embracing that will allow us actually to create, to create and excel. There is no compromise between them. We don't have to really be under stress to produce and, or to create. Actually, I think there is a negative correlation between them. So this vision actually was formulated in collaboration with the College of Nursing, with the Engineering Education Department. Uh, we were planning before the COVID-19 challenge to hold a retreat on May 1st, where we discussed this vision and adopted as a department and start building a strategy around it. Uh, I mean, if we can go back to work, we will hold the retreat. If not, we're considering about doing it virtual because this challenge is not slowing us anyway. So under this vision, uh, we are working on a holistic restructuring of departments. We're, we're, we're rethinking traditional way. That goes from policies, practice, culture, small and big decisions. So the promotion and tenure document that we have, uh, the, the 
the, the strategy, the way we allocate resources, the way we assign teaching. We're looking at all of those from the perspective of this vision. We're looking at this vision as a way to empower us to really pursue our passion in diversity and inclusion and equity. I don't see any obstacle between us and achieving parity, for example, in terms of the number of male and female uh, students that we get every year. We're far from there. Uh, and there is a long way ahead of us. But with the right vision, with the right strategy, we can definitely go there quickly. Um, we're working with the college because recruiting students from high school is a college and the university work, not a department work. The way it is right now is that we recruit from the first year students. So we're trying to work with them so we can actually help more with the recruitment from high school. Inclusion is, there is no healthy community without having everybody included. So we're actually moving away from traditional notions like faculty meetings more into a department meetings. We only have faculty meeting when the things we discuss are very limited in their scope to the interest of the faculty. But for example, the meeting we had today, the meeting we had last week is the department meeting because by harnessing our collective wisdom, that's how we move forward. One of the ideas that's really empowering under this vision is what we called in the proposal grand challenge communities. So when we looked at the undergrad education experience, we felt we're very strong in terms of the traditional curricular areas. So the courses under power, the courses under signal processing. So you can think of those as horizontal, horizontal things. But one of the gaps in the education is when the students is going through this, this is not necessarily connected to something the students are passionate about. So if you imagine now a grand challenge uh, under the banner of uh, health and wellness or under the banner of climate change or under the banner of security and trust. And you can consider this as a community, which is a vertical now. And that community can be advised by a faculty or a faculty council who would work with the course supervisors to make sure that the courses themselves are relevant to those grand challenges. And now the students from day one on campus can be part of this community, and while going through the courses or their education, they are still pursuing a, a, a grand challenge that they are passionate about. So if you, if you want to make a difference in the climate change debate that we have right now, and you're going through the class uh, on signal processing, well, I teach signal processing. Zia took my class, and I know he hates me for it. Uh, and he still remember how painful it was. But I can imagine if you want to make changes in climate change, I can 100% find some examples in Fourier Transform that aligns with that. So this way, that this education experience is actually connected together. It's leading to something that you are passionate about. In my very personal and limited view of the world, people learn when the initiative is coming from them, when it's not told to them. So departments and colleges and universities should allow the flower to grow and instead of fill the bucket with stuff. So in order to grow, you take the initiative and we empower you with the knowledge, we empower you with the skills, we empower you with the tools, but it has to be aligned with your interest. So that, that's our vision of how this could be connected. And that's actually important because we want to connect the undergrad with the grad. We want the experience of the students and the faculty to be connected together. One of the difficulties that all research universities are, have been facing in the last 15 years is that there is disconnect. Most of the faculty who are top stars in the research areas are typically focused on teaching graduate classes and disconnected from the undergrad experience. And the excellent teachers who are excelling at the undergrad level are typically disconnected from the research problems that handled by, the, by those top researchers. And that's not because they want it this way, it's because the curricular and the experience are actually disconnected. So people excel when they are pursuing something they're interested in. So when we connect this way, our plan is actually to incentivize, encourage and motivate and inspire the faculty and staff to be engaged in this one community that starts with the first year, ends when you finish a PhD. You don't have to pursue a PhD, you can exit anytime, but it's one experience. 
aligned with your interest. So along those lines, one of the big components in our vision is what's called Midstone class. And I give credit for this vision largely to Professor Steve Bibbick. I mean, he's, a, he's the intellectual force behind it. So Steve's main observation was Ohio State did an excellent job in the first year and then again at the senior year with the capstone. But in the middle years, the students seem to be disconnected. So they get in what Steve called a desert. So they are roaming around between a very good first year experience. A lot of the fundamentals are being taught in the sophomore and junior year, but the students are not making the connection. So Steve actually is working on a Midstone, a concept for Midstone class. It could be connected in his work on IoT, and that would be the connection between those. So I don't want to take more time than I should because I think I'm already, I mean, if you give a professor a mic, we talk forever. So um, um, I, that's it. I don't have more slides, I think. No, that's, uh, yes. So just the, the, this is, uh, I mean, again, uh, the, our one and only Ryan Horns. While doing that, we are completely honoring our tradition. This department has always been great. This is not new. So we're just taking a leap forward, building on the traditions we had. So I, I'm not artistic, so I'm not sure what Ryan was trying to achieve with this, but I think it's the kids now and the kids before. It's just a different color to the same picture. Thank you. Hey, thanks Dr. Algamal for that uh, introduction. Hey, so my name is Ian Mohammed. I'm the president of the EEEC Alumni Society. And so before we dive into a question and answer, we're just gonna be going over, you know, what is the society, how you can get involved, and what are the, some of the things that we do? So, it's always good to level set and start with what our mission is. So the mission of our society kind of started off back in 2009 when we were created. And it was really dedicated to the service and advancement of our alumni. And to kind of contextualize this and break it down, let's think of it in the form of two principles. One is bridging the gap and the other is alumni development and networking. But what does that actually mean? So bridging, bridging the gap is really focused in around the connection between alumni and our students. Our alumni are our greatest strength. They have vast industry and academic knowledge, and they can be a key resource for future Buckeye engineers as they advance their careers or as they're in their education. The hope of the society, or one of the principles, is around bridging this gap early so that both students and alumni can help each other pay it forward. The second one, is more true to its name. So Ohio State's network is a resource that alumni can even tap into. It doesn't just have to be students. And so one of the things that our alumni society's goal provides is to hold networking events, meetups, and other sessions for current alumni to connect and share ideas. Some of our focus areas are around the following. Scholarships is one of them. So over the course of the last school year, I think it was 2018 to 2019 specifically, we gave out 34,000 to about 65 students. And you can see the breakdown of how those awards were distributed. In addition to providing scholarships for students, we have reunions and meetups. So throughout the history, we've had about 20 meetups and plus or minus 10 reunions where these are really opportunities for our ECE alumni to come together, not only to build community and engagement, but also for the simpler things like tour, tours of our facilities, class reunions, research talks, as well as just general engagement. Speaking of engagement, how can you get involved? So we have a bunch of societies or committees, and so I'll explain kind of what those are. If you look at the QR code, if any of you just open up your camera app or any social media device, you can just tap on it and it'll take you to a web form on how to get involved. So we have our membership committee, and we're fortunate enough to have both David and Mark who head up these committees. They wanna say something about it later. But the membership committee is really to encourage active membership. So making sure that people are coming to 
the society, engage, send out email newsletters, physical mailings, share upcoming events, just so we can encourage active membership. And then the second one is the meeting and programs committee. Um, for people who are interested in crafting the next big event, they wanna help organize local events, or you know, they're interested in hosting talks or whatever they're interested in to their heart's content really. Um, the meetings and programs committee really falls in that section. In the effort to keep it succinct, so we have enough time for question and answer, um, I'll kind of share some contact information so you can see who are some of the people uh, to get involved in. These are some of our board members and officers. Um, again, you have that join today link, but wanted to keep it succinct, um, give everyone a quick overview of what our society is, um, some of the ways that we can help you as alumni, or you know, help students if you are interested in fostering those connections. But really it all starts with you getting involved. And so the best way to do that is to you know, head over to our website. We'll have a Google form that'll ask you what are some of the things that you're interested in and kind of go from there. Mark or David, I don't know if you wanna add anything about the committees, but provided a quick overview. Thank you, Zia, and thank you, Dr. Elgamal. Um, I think now we can open up if anyone has questions they want to type into the chat, or um, you know, if you want to raise your hand or um, unmute your mic. Um, that was a really uh, interesting talk, and I'm I'm really uh, inspired by the the passion that you are bringing to the department with some of these wellness initiatives. I think um, I'm. Excited about about the direction that you're taking. So thank you. Thank you, David. Zia wrote me a recommendation letter for them. Yeah, it was really interesting to see how um, you're taking the department forward and trying to bridge in um, things that are relevant in industry to academia. Because sometimes I think there's that disconnect, but it's good to see that it's working towards that. So Hashem, what's, what's your vision that may, and, and it's how unique or, or, or trend setting it is. Are you, is, are you finding this similar across the College of Engineering or are you kind of setting the tone? Uh, so, am I here? no. So definitely uh, Ohio State is in a very good position for this wellness. I give credit to the leadership because uh, when we started digging into this, we found out the School of Nursing or the College of Nursing is, is a pioneering college when it comes to notions of wellness. I would say in terms of taking it to engineering, I would like to think that we're pioneering and leading the way, not just at Ohio State, but nationally. So there are, everybody is realizing that students are facing uh, a lot of mental pressure. And I would add to that faculty too. Uh, faculty are very, nationally are very stressed out. I would say the key innovation in our concept is we're not looking at this as just a way uh, to, uh, from, from an, if you will, a negative perspective. We definitely want to care for people who are stressed out, but we also look at this as enabler for creativity. So I, I, I genuinely believe that if people are having fun and happy in a positive environment, they will create. So I want to be proactive. I don't want to wait until people are stressed out and, and then deal with the notion of how to help them to relieve the stress. I want the idea that we should be inspired instead of stressed to be a foundational idea. Um, and actually it goes, um, I, I can tell you a personal side of it, like my research. Over the last few years, you see people being obsessed with the number of papers, the funding, how, how, how much money I'm bringing, how many grants I'm getting, those kind of things. But when you actually look around at how many great ideas are coming out, well, definitely not proportional to the hard work that's coming into the play. Because people are now so much into the wheel, so much running around, so much under pressure to produce things, and they are not really coming at this from a curiosity anymore. So my belief, and I think most of us in the department, the overwhelming majority agree with me that 
we need to rediscover this. We need to reinvent it in, a, in some way and align our interests. So we have people who like to do things in a certain way, like the experiment I was mentioning today, the large online experiment. Everyone from our faculty is coming to this with a different perspective. Everyone has a strength. So some of them like to record things. Some of them like to do it online. Some of them like to record it and do a flip classroom. What I'm asking them is run those experiments, create and innovate, try to get data so we can collectively come together in the summer and learn from each other. I don't want to come in. I never, I, I never do that stuff. So I never went to them and says, here is the way you should deliver the course. No, let's try your way, but get the data and it's right on it. I think they are having fun. I feel people are happy and I enjoy it. There's a question here in the chat uh, about a Caldwell lab update. Do you have anything to say on that? Okay, so uh, we were working on renovations. Uh, Ryan was leading the way of making Caldwell look much more pretty than it is. In terms of a new building, uh, this was something that we were planning to put in front of the queue of the capital projects for the college. Um, so the college was focused on what they call BMEC 1, BMEC 2, and we wanted Caldwell to be the one after that. The reality of the situation uh, of after the outbreak, the COVID-19 challenge is we don't have clarity now on how those capital projects will move forward. So we want to wait and see how the state budget, how the priorities will change. Um, we definitely are interested in state-of-the-art facilities, but what we have been focused on is more our people. And I think our investment paid off because that culture is what allowed us to continue to excel at a time of challenge. So we didn't forget about it, but, um, but I think a, an honest assessment that it's now on hold until we figure out how this COVID-19 challenge will affect the economy of the state. Yeah, yeah the AFRL connection. So uh, the AFRL connection, so it, it's related to ESL and beyond the ESL. Uh, that's a question by Barry. So. The, the center of excellence that I refer to in hardware security is ESL. Uh, uh, Walid is a faculty in ECE and ESL. But Chippy also have very strong connections with, uh, with AFRL. Uh, Signal Processing Group has very strong connections with, uh, with AFRL. Uh, Lee Potter, Phil Schneider, Randy Moses. Randy is our senior associate VP, but we are still, uh, he's still affiliated with that. So. Uh, so that particular center is with ESL, but, uh, but the, the relationship with AFRL is, 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 is definitely encompassing the department in, in different ways. I think the first, I think Chippy actually was formed with the help of uh, the chair of our industrial advisory board, uh, Bill Borger, and he's, a, he's an AFRL alum. Uh, I do not know what's CRADA. So maybe we, I, I do not know. So this, the center of excellence is an AFOSR funded. It's a competition that runs, uh, uh, by AFOSR. I don't think it's a special program. Uh, so, but I can definitely get you more information, uh, through an offline communication about this. Hey, Hashem, uh, maybe you can uh, comment on some of the key factors that caused that dramatic rise in the rankings of our graduate program from 30th to 22nd. So um, it's our focus on spreading the word about our quality. So ranking uh, is, uh, is, is a vote by different department chairs about the department. And we always believe that we are underappreciated and underranked. Last year, we we made a concerted effort 
to invite department chairs to visit us, to encourage our faculty to go and present our department in different places. Ryan did an excellent job of, uh, of promoting the department in the nation. We are actually launching an initiative. I should be sending the email this weekend of getting department chairs in Ohio together. And it cannot be more timely than that. So uh, we want to get them together. We want to collaborate and learn from each other. And it, as a byproduct of that, they will, they will learn more about our quality. As we are seeing this challenge, I think Ohio State has the capability and has the responsibility also to work with other departments, to help them if they need with our resources and to learn from them. They have a lot to offer. So we want to build this relationship with departments in Ohio and a byproduct of that, people know more about us. So what we did last year was very focused on spreading the word and it pays off. But on the long term, the stability of the ranking and the jump to the top 10 is about excellence. It's about the excellence of our students, is about the excellence of our faculty and staff. That's what lasts. So what it worked for us last year because we were already in an excellent position. It's just people didn't know much about us. Another question. Um, so for alumni who are watching and they're interested in helping contribute to the growth of the department, what suggestions would you have for them to kind of get involved or steps that they could take in order to assist the College of Engineering? Feedback, ideas, support in all forms. So this is the journey we go in together. So the idea from today was to share with you our thinking. Would love to hear from you when you were going through your education experience at Ohio State, what worked for you? When you look back from your experience right now, after you've been in the real world for a few years, and I don't necessarily like the, I, the, the expression of the real world because the university is real too, but uh, how, does, how do you see that now? Uh, would you have liked us to open up our curriculum more and allow you to take more classes in art and science, in business? Did you feel that there are certain aspects that were missing? Have you heard about things that, excite you that from graduates of other places uh, uh, again this has to be our collective wisdom so engage with us let us know what you think send us feedback work with us through this journey because um, the way i see it we go through education we think of the best thing that happened to us and we want to make it even better for kids who come after us and as we're moving one of the things that will happen next year naturally because of what's going on right now is people will start question the value of traditional higher education if we can deliver all the courses online why do we need to be on campus now we should not be tempted to think education can be boiled down to coursework that's de delivered online when i look back at my life what changed my life was few discussions with faculty that happened outside the classroom, and I still remember them till today. When I was a PhD student, it was my advisor. When I was undergrad, I still remember three discussions with three different faculty that came off in a casual way when I was asking about something, and they changed my life. So I believe higher education is about allowing this ecosystem. However, that doesn't mean we have to stick to only the traditional approach. We should use technology. We should use online tools, but it's not just delivering material online. And that's going to be a challenge for people to adapt, and it will be an opportunity for us to come up with things that we did not think about before. So this is a journey that your insight, your opinions, your experience will be very useful to us. Thank you. Hashem, uh, you mentioned uh, a lot about the recruitment goals uh, around diversity and underrepresented groups uh, to try to help, you know, and especially aligns very closely to the wellness goals and, and that you have with the new vision. Um, being that I'd like to make this an annual event so we can show our progress toward those, uh, what's our baseline right now as far as uh, 
percentage of our population students in those areas? Uh, 13 percent. Uh, the percentage, it's not something, it's, there is a long room for improvement. I think the percentage of uh, students, uh, female students and underrepresented in the undergrad is 13 percent. In the grad, it's a little bit less than that. Uh, it's probably the same as the national average. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that I deeply think can be improved significantly. Um, but that has to be a collaborative effort because the way, the way it is right now is um, the, the recruitment for the first year is managed by the university, not managed by us. So we can only improve uh, our diversity by, uh, by promoting ourselves more to the students in the first year. And one of the things we feel will be very useful in that is this notion of a community of Grand Challenge. Because just from everything I read, kids those days are much more mature than me when I was a kid. So they pick major thinking about, I, I picked my major because I was good at math and science. I was bad at everything else. So I just came to EC. I had no idea why I was doing that. I couldn't really care less. It was interesting and I was just doing it. When I look at kids now choosing their majors, they are thinking of things like, how will this change the world? What's my impact on society? ECE as a discipline didn't do a good job necessarily historically in highlighting our impact in society. So kids don't really understand that if you actually want to make, a, if you want to actually cure cancer, ECE can actually be a, can be your discipline if you want to cure cancer. It doesn't, you don't have to go by medical engineering to do that. Um, we are not doing a very good job in this. And I like it. So it's not just a promotion or advertising. It's actually changing our curriculum to keep highlighting and, um, and emphasizing that throughout the time. So this is what we're taking, the approach we're taking, to make sure that it's a lasting impact. One other thing is the notion of role models. So last year, we held focus groups for our um, women students. And to see how, the, how, how, how is the, um, our environment is perceived and how we can be more inclusive. And one of the things we heard is that uh, the, it, they find it really useful when they see role models. So we're starting a series of events where we actually, I think it's once every semester now, where we invite them to meet our outstanding women faculty uh, and researchers. And it's actually very highly attended. Uh, the number of full professors, uh, female full professors, uh, grew from one to three last year because we successfully promoted one of our outstanding associate professors to full professor, and we hired the first uh, female endowed chair in the history of the department, uh, Professor Eileen Yonner. So we actually try in our distinguished seminar series to bring role models because uh, at least from the focus group and also from things I read, uh, when they have doubts about their ability to succeed in a field, when they see people who have succeeded before, it makes them feel more included. It makes them feel positive about this. So um, it's, it's a long-term strategy. Uh, every year we're working very hard, but I think we're going to be successful in achieving our goals. C Carnegie Mellon, uh, computer science at least, achieved parity last year, uh, male-female parity by changing their admission criteria and by being smart about it. So one of the things they did in computer science, for example, is introducing certain classes. So they observed that out of high school, uh, male students have more uh, programming skill than female students. It's not that because they are smarter. It's just because they were spending more time in programming. So what Carnegie Mellon did was actually introduce a class for the incoming female students just for programming. And as expected, after this class, the skill level was the same. So because they just spent time doing it. So they changed the admission, they introduced those things, and now they have achieved parity. And we strongly believe that diversity is essential to success. Diversity in everything, intellectual diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, diversity in socioeconomic brackets, bringing people with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different views, is essential for success. Our discipline will not succeed if we don't understand that. So this is a service we're doing for the whole discipline, not only for our department. ECE and computer science and mechanical engineering 
cannot be singular in their views. They have to be diverse. They have to listen to people who come, come with different ideas. And by opening up this way, I think we're moving in the right direction. Just want to throw it out to the audience to see if anyone out there has a, a question. One, one of the, uh, the areas that since I've been involved more in the department the last five years and really learning what opportunities and research and everything's going on, one of the things I think that really hasn't been touched on yet in this session is just the amazing set of opportunities that, that undergraduate students have today. You know, all the different clubs uh, related, uh, the undergraduate research, basically when I was there 30 years ago, no one in undergraduate did research. So I don't know if you want to touch on that, because I know it would, it would line greatly with your uh, grant uh, challenge community type efforts. And that's one of the big differentiators that we need to focus on from the, tr from the simple online delivery of stuff. Kids learn more when they are engaged in experience. It's not just sitting in a class. And as I agree with you, Mark, it's aligned with this community. Um, I think that the idea now is just to be laser focused on it. So it was going for sure, and there was a lot of activity. But just aligning all of us in the same direction, that's what's actually happening right now. Realizing that this is, if you want to have a top PhD program and you are thinking strategically, start with us and build undergrad because those are the kids who will build your top PhD program. So don't wait and recruit the kids at that level. Work from the beginning because that's what's going to happen. If you want your alumni to go to the industry, and then stay connected with you and help you build your research program, work with them when they are undergrad. So this continuity, being intentional about it as a department is my hope that we all come together and move in, in that direction. Zia, do you have anything else you want to? Well, I think that's it for me. Um, I know we're also kind of getting the time right. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're about that hour mark. So I wanted to make sure we uh, give people opportunity. Uh, I, I think this is a really good overview. Um, I, I, Hashem, I appreciate you taking the time and, and putting this together and Ryan to help organize. Um, you know, I've, I've always said that you know, since I became more involved, uh, you know, with the department, and everything it's just been amazed. You know, it's not, it's something that I've grown to really appreciate and understand so much better by seeing some things firsthand and, and just understanding how much the department has changed. Uh, and, and I think the more we can get that word out to the alumni and get them involved, I think, uh, I think that'll help your, your, your uh, efforts, Hesham, just from a standpoint of helping with the perception and, and passing the word around, as well as getting alumni involved. So, um, I thank everybody who's attending, so feel free to reach out to us uh, via the methods that, that Zia uh, put up. I think Zia, we have a couple action items here as far as how we get that feedback from the alums. That's something we can do and, and help with uh, providing that to, for Hesham uh, so that they can go ahead and continue to chart their course. So just thank you all. Thank you, Mark, Zia, Ryan. So companies make gadgets. Wall Street makes money. We make people. So we are very <laughs> proud. It's all about you. That's the main thing. At the end of the day, it's our students. It's our alums. So that's that's it. So we're, we're we if if we're doing something good, it's actually you excelling where you are and continue to give us feedback. So the next generation will be even more excelling and and more amazing than you. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So um, we'll go ahead and record this. We'll, we'll finish the recording. We'll post it. We'll get it communicated so other people can go ahead and, and see all the great stuff going on. Hey, Ryan, did you want to go ahead and, and showcase any information where people can get more, any spots where people can get more information? Yeah, I think the, the uh, hopefully you can hear me. I uh, just unmuted. Um, I think the, the greatest strength that we have is our numbers. And if we can all collectively 
use those numbers of all, people all over the world in a word of mouth way, we can really make a whole lot of change. So um, if anybody wants to stay connected to what I have been doing on a daily basis, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we got LinkedIn, uh, all those things. I'll be putting up broad snapshot of research um, and uh, stories about faculty uh, every week. So. It's all about yeah, think, this whole ranking thing is Ryan. I'm just like, that's, that's the reality of it, man. <laughs> yep. And, and I think it's uh, ece.osu.edu, right? Yes. The website. Yes. Good start for everything. So stay home, please. This is a personal message has nothing to do with the thing. Please stay home. Don't listen to the media. If it says you should go out, stay home, please. We want you safe and healthy. Everything else can come after that.